We are thankful that you're here. Uh, we have a lot of visitors. Thank you so much for coming. We appreciate you supporting us, and uh, we in turn will uh, do our best to support you when you have functions at your home congregations. If you're not a member of the Church of Christ and you have questions about the sermon that you're going to hear tonight, uh, one of the elders here, uh, or Brother BJ, I'm sure, would be glad to answer some questions for you. You can see us after the uh, sermon, or after the uh, closing prayer, that is. Uh, today is the second day of our meeting with Brother BJ Clark. And if you um, were not able to uh, be here yesterday or to view those sermons, they are on Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, so I encourage you to uh, watch those videos. Uh, three outstanding lessons yesterday, and I know today will, will be uh, nothing uh, different from that. I'm getting real close here. <laughs> Just a moment. If it doesn't work, I'm going to blame it on my son, Ryan, back there in that corner. <laughs> we will be having the gospel meeting through Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, 7 o'clock each uh, evening. We invite you back any time that you can be here. We will have an opening prayer after a couple of songs by Brother James Johnston from the 4th and Vine Church of Christ in Corning. We're thankful for his presence again tonight. And the closing prayer will be Brother uh, Robbie Cook from the Nettleton congregation. Y'all go ahead and clear your throats. We're going to sing here in just a second. <laughs> Maybe. And I tell you what. I'm going to have to, uh-oh. There we go. Technology is wonderful when it works. Who said that? <laughs> We're going to begin with number four tonight. Number four, A Beautiful Life. We're going to sing verses one, two, three, and five of this song. <clears throat>
Number 319. 319. I need thee every hour. We'll sing all four verses of this song after the song last Brother James Johnston to lead us in our opening prayer. <clears throat> I need Our Heavenly Father, it's a great privilege to be here tonight, and we thank you for this opportunity to hear your word proclaimed. We pray that you be with those who are sick and struggling, that you be with them, and there's many people over the past few years who have lost loved ones, and we pray you'll be with them and strengthen them. Help us to be an encourager, a, strengthen, a person that strengthens each other, that develops and helps other people along the way to find you. Help us to serve you with all our heart and with all our soul, with all our mind, and help us to take these things to heart we learned tonight. In Christ's name, amen. 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 <clears throat> Number 933. Number 933. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 3 of this song. <clears throat> Some wonderful day when my name is called from the roll of my for heaven above. I think so go there to the home on high to dwell with my Lord.
invitation song for this evening be number 465. I was blessed to attend the Memphis School of Preaching from 2011 to 2013. Now correct me brother BJ if I'm wrong. I think you became the director in 2013. If I'm not mistaken I was the first class that graduated when you were the director and I consider that a blessing and a privilege. And uh, we've been enjoying this meeting. Know that tonight will be another good night to hear and soak up God's Word. And we're so thankful for everyone's attendance. If you're here tonight and you're looking for a Bible study or to know what to do to be saved, you'll, you'll hear it tonight. And if you need any more support or help, we'll be glad to help you. But without further ado, let's give God's Word our undivided attention. Well, my parents always taught me to own up if you mess up. And I'm the one that put this good brother in the position that he was in tonight of having to scramble. And uh, I handed him a, I asked, is it too late for a PowerPoint? And he graciously said it wasn't. And I think that uh, my last minute notification of him in that department is uh, certainly something I should own up to. <laughs> Thank you for working with me to try to make this uh, available because I think there is a visual aspect of this, especially near the end, that will help folks uh, to see the simplicity of God's Word. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to be with you all here tonight. I very, very much appreciate the congregation here and your kindness toward us. <clears throat> and it's good to see folks that we know and love from a number of different places represented here tonight. Did Jesus ever build the church he said he was going to build? The setting that you see on the screen is Caesarea Philippi. And the brother that preaches named Jeff Archie handed me his Bible and said, you know, we may not ever be here again. Why don't you... Uh, sit down and read the text here that happened in this very vicinity, somewhere in this very region is where this happened. And so, I want to direct your attention to the text that uh, certainly is depicted on the screen behind you as far as the backdrop. If you'll go to Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 16 in your copy of God's Word, you will find that the Bible tells us here that uh, Jesus in verse 13 came into the region of Caesarea Philippi. And the Bible tells us that he asked, Whom do men say that I the Son of Man am? They said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. 
He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And that's when Peter spoke up. And he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus pronounced a blessing upon him for that, said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood has not revealed this to thee, but uh, my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven is the literal meaning of the tense. And so here we find Jesus promising to build the church. Now I'd like to ask you again the question that I asked a moment ago. Did he ever do that? And if he did do it, when did he do it? When did people become members of it? How did they become members of it? Are you, am I, a member of the same church that Jesus built? And if I'm not, how can I get to the church that Jesus built and, and not be a member of something that was built by man? That is the question that we want to address tonight. I want to notice with you, if you look on the screen, that this was a perfect a backdrop for Jesus to utter these words. In fact, this ridge that you see above me, it actually stretches in both directions. If you were to count the distance in both directions, this rocky ledge or ridge goes for about a mile. And so it makes perfect sense that Jesus would have walked to Caesarea Philippi with his disciples to ask them a question. He could have asked them anywhere, but he asked them here because he wanted the rock-solid nature of the church's foundation to be visually demonstrated as well. And so the rock-solid foundation of the church is not Peter. It's what Peter confessed. What Peter confessed is that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that bedrock of truth is the foundation upon which the church of our Lord is built. Now, I'd like to notice with you the promise to build a church, and we've spotlighted some phrases. Notice the future tense, I will build. He hadn't yet built it. May I remind you that John the baptizer died two chapters before this. And so this is uh, obvious indication that the church had not yet come into existence. And Matthew 16 shows that Jesus would be the builder of it. It would wear his name because he's the one that would build it. He's the one that would purchase it. He said, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. I've never understood why there's so much controversy with some folks as to whether the church and the kingdom are the same thing. What sense would it make for Jesus to say, I'm going to build one thing and give you the keys to something else? There is an element in connection between the kingdom and the church. And in this passage, certainly they are depicted as being the same institution. And may I remind you that in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, on the right-hand side of the chart, the church is called something else. Paul calls the church the house of God, the house of God, which is the church of the living God. So it's a kingdom, it's a house, it's a called-out group. That's what the word church means. And you know the blueprint for building this church was laid long before you get to the New Testament. In fact, I invite your attention back to 2 Samuel chapter 7. David had told the prophet about his idea to build God a house. And he was thinking about a physical structure that he would build, a temple. It's true that Solomon, his son, would build it. But as we're going to see, God basically, even though Nathan the prophet at first says, that's a great idea, you ought to do it. God got a hold of Nathan that night and said, you need to go back and tell him, no, he's not going to build me a house. I'm going to build him one. One of his descendants is going to build him a house that will be connected to me. And so you see it. David is thus told in verse 12, when thy days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, you'll be dead and buried, but I will set up thy seed after thee. He goes on to say, I will establish his kingdom, notice, 
and he shall build a house for my name, and I'll establish the throne of his kingdom, and how long would it last? Forever. This shows you this can't be Solomon, because Solomon did not stay on the throne forever. Solomon would build something that would be a type of that which the Davidic descendant would build, but a greater than Solomon would build something greater than what Solomon built. And it would be great indeed in every way. It is the church of our Lord, the house of God, the kingdom of God. Now, in Isaiah chapter 2, we see verse 2, it shall come to pass. Now, when is it going to happen? Well, it's going to happen in the last days, Isaiah predicted. Where is it going to happen? Well, the mountain of the Lord's house is going to be established in the top of the mountains, and it will be exalted above the hills. Who's going to be invited to become a part of this household? All nations shall ultimately flow unto it. And so it would be a household for all nations, Jew and Gentile. Notice, many people shall go and say, Come ye, let's go up to the house of, uh, to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. File that away, will you please? The house of the God of Jacob. That's going to be very significant here in a moment. He'll teach us of his ways. We'll walk in his paths. Out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now this is starting to come to pass, and I will date myself uh, with a number of the rest of the folks in here who will be able to identify with what I'm saying. Only the younger people will wonder and be mystified about what I'm about to describe. Polaroid pictures were amazing at the time that they first came out. You didn't have to take your film and leave it with someone else to develop. Your camera would spit out a snapshot and you could hold that snapshot in your hand and watch it come into focus one section at a time. And it wouldn't all just poof into a clarity at a moment like a, we, we don't even have to watch the poof. When we take our f pictures with our digital phones in an instant, we know whether we want it or don't want it. It's already developed instantaneously. We see it. But that wasn't the way back then during the Polaroid era. It was faster, though, than taking it to someone else and waiting for them to get the pictures back to you. But I, I always noticed that this part would start coming clear, okay, and then this part starting to come into focus. And if you just were patient, the whole thing would come into focus. The Old Testament is, is kind of like a slowly developing Polaroid of the coming church. This part starts coming, David, you're going to be dead and buried when one of your descendants is going to establish a kingdom and build me a house. It'll be my house, the Lord's house. It'll be established in Jerusalem in the last days. Out of Zion shall go forth the law, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and all nations will flow unto it. And so now we're looking, is there a time that is classified and defined as the last days? where the Lord's church is established in Jerusalem, the house of God, the kingdom of Christ? Well, let's see about it. When Mary was informed of the startling news that she was going to have a child, it's startling because she'd never been with a man in such a way as to produce a child. And so this is information that really gets her attention. She's going to conceive and bring forth a son, call his name Jesus, he'll be great, He'll be the son of the highest, and the Lord God will give him, give Jesus, the throne of his ancestor, his father, David. Yes. And then look at the language that's in red there at the bottom. He shall reign over the house of Jacob. The house of Jacob. Now, what did Isaiah call this? He called it in Isaiah 2 and verse 3, the house of of the God of Jacob. That's the one that's going to be established in Jerusalem in the last days. And Jesus is the one who's going to build this house and reign over this house of Jacob. How long will he reign over it? Forever. Solomon didn't reign over the house forever, but Jesus would never have a successor. No one would ever come along and take his place as ruler over this house 
and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And so it's a house, it's a kingdom. And the Davidic descendant Jesus would reign over it and establish it and build it and rule over it. Now, here's some real getting closer uh, passage right here. Mark 9, 1. Jesus is talking to some people in the first century. He says, some of you standing here, imagine that you're standing there listening to him in the first century. He looks at your group and says, some of them that stand here will not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come. And how would it come? With power. All right? That means the kingdom has been established or else there are some people tonight who are 2,000 plus years old or about 2,000 years old. I've never seen any of those folks. They don't exist. They didn't have to live that long. If Jesus told the truth, and he did, then those folks were alive when the kingdom came. And the kingdom came when? When the power came. Well, where would the power come? Look at uh, Luke 24 on the right-hand side of the chart. You'll notice that Jesus tells his apostles as he's getting ready to ascend into heaven. Now, this makes perfect sense when you put it with what we saw in Isaiah 2. The word of the Lord will go forth from Jerusalem. It's no wonder then that Jesus told his apostles, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but you stay, you tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power. Uh, the power is coming from, off from on high. Some of you standing here will not die until the kingdom comes with power. The power will come from on high while you apostles are gathered in Jerusalem. Now we're getting somewhere. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 is going to help us. And that, that question that we ask, did Jesus ever build the church he said he was going to build? To answer that question, we need to find the right place, Jerusalem, the right time period, the last days, and we need to find David dead and buried. Can we find one passage that puts all those two, all those things together? And uh, the answer is very clear. In Acts 1.8, you shall receive power, the apostles were told, after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you apostles. It was specifically promised to them, not to the 120, but to the apostles. Trace the pronouns from Acts 1 and follow them, and you'll find the apostles are the ones that are the ones being promised this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And this is all going to start where? Notice in blue left-hand side of the screen, in Jerusalem. That's where it all starts. It's what Isaiah said. And so, yes. And then we see, do we ever see a time when the church is established on the day when the power comes from on high in the city of Jerusalem and David is dead and buried and it's the last days? Do we see that? In Acts 2, the day of Pentecost is now fully arrived. They, the apostles, trace it back to Acts 1.26. The apostles, they were all with one accord in one place. They, that's the apostles, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak as the Spirit gave them utterance. What God said would happen, did happen. It happened where God said it would happen, in Jerusalem. And do we have all nations represented here? In one sense, we do. And we will see the Gentiles grafted in later in Acts 10 and, and beyond. But you'll notice that even in Acts 2 and verse 5, it says, There were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. And the word of the Lord would go forth from Jerusalem, Isaiah predicted. And so now we see, do we see the last days? Does the Apostle Peter pinpoint this day as equating with the last day spoken of in prophecy. Yeah. Even though he quotes from Joel's prophecy, he pinpoints the same time period because both Joel and Isaiah said something would happen in the last days. Joel predicted the Spirit would be poured out in the last days. Isaiah predicted the Lord's house would be established in the last days. And so, sure enough, Acts 2, 16 and 17, 
This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, it shall come to pass in the last days. And I was taught that when the Bible says this is that, that's that. That's all there is to it. There's no other reason to look for any other explanation. The church of our Lord is about, what, what about David being dead and buried? Is that ever emphasized in Acts 2? Well, you'll notice verse 29 of Acts 2. Men and brethren, this is Peter's sermon recorded. All of the apostles are preaching. But this is the statement, men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried. Stop right there and let me ask you this question. When Peter said that, were the people on Pentecost going, whoa, that's breaking news. Did you know David died? I didn't know he died. Friends, that's ludicrous. At the time Peter uttered the words in Acts 2.29, David had been dead almost a thousand years. So ask yourself, if David is dead and buried, and he has been for a thousand years at the time Peter's speaking these words, why is he bringing it up as if it's some major piece of information that needs to be focused upon? Because, uh, David, when you're dead and buried, one of your descendants is going to establish me a kingdom and build me a house. He'll be one of your descendants. Luke 1, Mary, your child is going to be given the throne of his father, David. It's all coming into pick the pictures developing right before our very eyes. He's both dead and buried. He goes on to preach that the promise of the Holy Spirit had been fulfilled. And sure enough, you remember back in the verse number 36, after he said, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly, God has made the same Jesus you crucified, both Lord and Christos, anointed one, the Christ. Some of the people said, well, what shall we do? Men and brethren, what shall we do? They're pricked in their hearts. The answer is given to them so clearly. And may I suggest to you lovingly but firmly that if ever there were a time when a man could have said to a gathered audience, I want every head bowed. I want every head bowed right now. Repeat this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I make you the Lord of my life. I'm asking you tonight in love, but I'm asking you with, I hope, what will be thought-provoking if you've not thought about this before. I'm asking you tonight, did the Apostle Peter lead the folks who asked him, what shall we do in the sinner's prayer, yes or no? No. Then why do we have folks today doing that? That's not biblical. It's not what's in this text. It's not what's in any text. I lovingly challenge anyone to show me a text where someone who's not a Christian prays in order to become a Christian. I, I cannot find that. It's not in the Bible. I can find that the answer given on this occasion is the same answer I would give if someone interrupted this sermon tonight and said, I can't wait another second to obey the gospel. What do I need to do? I'd tell them, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Should I tell them something different than what was already told them by someone who was speaking as the Spirit gave him utterance? No. This is the Word of God then, it's the Word of God tonight, and I'm not going to shy away from it just because it's not popularly preached. It is what the Word of God says. Is it not, dear friends, here tonight? You know that it is. You can see it in your own Bible. I say this not to be hurtful, but to be helpful. Not to be divisive, but to be devoted to the Word of God and to its strength to save those who are seeking salvation. So, did anyone hear the words, repent and be baptized, and say, yes, I'm going to do that? About 3,000 did. And they were added. According to Acts 2.41, they were added. Added to what? Acts 2.47 says, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved is the real meaning of that last phrase that's translated there. Okay, so let's think this through. Those folks on Pentecost were being added to the church 
So as of Acts 2, do you have the church of our Lord Jesus Christ in existence? Did Jesus ever build the church he said he was going to build? Yes or no? Here it is. Acts 2. Now, I went to a debate one time years ago, and this man said in very mocking fashion, he said, if you want to know whether a Bible belongs to someone who's a member of one of the churches of Christ, he said, there's an easy test. He said, just get a hold of their Bible, go like this, let it fall open, and if they're a member of the church of Christ, it'll fall open to Acts 2 every time. That's what he said. And he thought that was cute. Mine fell open to Isaiah 29, but I'm a member of the Lord's church and more than happy for this Bible to fall open to any page because they all point to that singular event in Acts 2 when the scheme of redemption comes into fruition. And then after that, those passages point back to that as a signal event in which the Lord's church came into existence. I would not be ashamed to have, in fact, he went on to say, he said, those people have greasy spot on the pages of Acts 2 because their fingerprints have been on that page so many times, you can see a greasy spot there. Are you ashamed of that tonight, dear friends? No. That is the culmination of God's scheme of redemption. The church eternally purposed by God, Ephesians 3, 9 to 11, that had been prophesied and predicted and prepared for is now presented and we see people who are members of it and you can be a member of the same church tonight. Someone says, well, but you know what, preacher, isn't one church as good as another? Oh, we hear that. I know we hear it. And people believe it sometimes. They say, well, you know, one church is as good as another. Well, you remember what the Bible calls the church in 1 Timothy 3.15? the house of God. May I ask you, do you believe that one house is as good as another? Do you believe that? Now, it's true that uh, someone might have a happier home in a shack than they would in a mansion, and I'm aware of that, but I can promise you this, that when you go looking for a house, you're looking for one that's got some good solid structure to it, and you don't just say, well, I don't really care. One house is as good as another. I'll just live wherever. Now, you put some time and thought into it. Where do I want to live? And you know, Jesus actually taught about whether one house is as good as another. Near the end of one of the most famous sermons ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, he told of two builders. The wise man built his house upon the rock. And the rains came down, floods came up. House on the rock stands firm. Because it's built upon a rock. Matthew chapter 7, 24 through 27. Uh, but there's this foolish man. He builds his house on the sand. And there's no earth foundation under it. It's just earth. And so it's easily knocked down by the storm. The winds blow vehemently. And that house fell. Great was the fall of it. Because it has no solid foundation upon which to rest. So let me ask you. In the parable of the two builders, is one house as good as another? You tell me. Was one house as good as another? No. Jesus identified that one house is better than another. The house built on the rock is the one you want to be in. Well, if you have a choice between being built, being in the house built on the rock, Jesus Christ, the one built in Acts 2, or being one that's built on the shaky foundation of the doctrines and commandments of men, is there a difference between the two houses, yes or no? Absolutely there is. And you know this idea that one house is as good as another has never been true even in the Old Testament. Now, let me ask you, when it came time for the flood, was there a prediction given of a coming flood? There certainly was. Was there a preparation made for a safe place where men could go and be saved from the flood? Yes. I want to ask you, how many locations for salvation did God tell Noah to build? How many locations for salvation 
do we read about in Genesis chapter 6? How many? Please don't tell me that God would never confine salvation to one location. He's done it. He did it on that occasion. In fact, if someone had asked Noah, Noah, come here, please, come here. Are, are you saying that when this flood comes, you say is coming? Are you saying that only you and your group aboard that ark are going to be saved? Is that what you're saying? May I ask you tonight what the correct answer to that question would have been? If Noah had been asked, are you saying we have to board that ark in order to be among the saved? What was the right answer to that question? I can promise you this. It would not have been arrogant for Noah to say, that's where God said to go. Who am I to change it? That would have been humble. Arrogance would have been for Noah to say, you know what? That does sound pretty narrow, doesn't it? I tell you what. I'm going to recommend that you get on board this boat here, this house. But if you want to say a prayer to God and ask him to save you outside of where he told you to go, who am I to stop you? You go ahead and you just pray the flood prayer. The, you pray and ask him to, to lift you up above the flood waters until the waters subside and that you can be placed then gently on the dry earth after the waters have dried up. Friends, Noah would never have been so arrogant as to change the will of God. And if God said salvation was in that, bo that boat, that ark, was one house as good as another when the flood came? If you were in your house when the flood came, would that have been just as good as being in the house God told Noah to build? No. One was going to be saved, one was seaworthy, and one was going to perish, and you would perish in it. And so this isn't complicated. It, it, it isn't hard. In fact, I want to ask it another way from another Old Testament example. Was one house as good as another during the tenth plague? Now, let me examine this with you. You remember Exodus 12. Uh, here's what I'm going to do, and I want you, Moses and Aaron, to tell the people what I'm going to do and tell them what to do. Here's what I want them to do. I want you to, verse 3 of Exodus 12, speak to all the congregation of Israel. All of them need to hear these instructions. In the tenth day of this month, stop right there. Does it have to be the tenth day? I mean, as a day, as a day, as a day, as a day, as long as you do something for God, does God ever get so persnickety that he would say, well, you did it, but you did it on the wrong day? I want to tell you, if God says the tenth day, and I respect him, what day will I do it? The tenth day. And they could count back then. They know how to count to ten. They knew what day was the tenth day, and on the tenth day, what were they supposed to do? One day wasn't as good as another. He says, in the tenth day of this month, well, so what if they said, no, 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 no. I'm going to wait till the 10th day of next month. Well, God says this month. If I respect God, when am I going to do it? This month. That's the month. One month wasn't as good as another. Take every man a lamb. Is one lamb as good as another? Look at verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish. So a blemished lamb would not have been as good as an unblemished lamb. And was a one gender as good as another? He says it needs to be a male. Was one age as good of the first year? And he says, you can take it out from either the sheep or from the goats. Either one will be all right. Now, what are they supposed to do with this? Keep it till the 14th day of the month, same month. Now, what happens if they say, you know what? I just can't wait for the 14th day. I'm so anxious to do what God wants me to do. I'm going to do all this on the 12th. Friends, if God tells you the 14th, does he give you the liberty to say, I'll change the day because I feel in my heart it would be better if I did it early? If God wants it on the 14th day, what day will you give it? 14th day, one day is not as good as another to sacrifice it. And so, uh, what are you supposed to do on that 14th day? Kill it. 
is one time of day to kill it as good as kill it in the evening. God's specific enough to say, I want it killed in the evening. All right, once you kill it, is what am I supposed to do with the blood? Smear it on the house. But where is one place to smear the blood just as good as another? God says in verse number 7, they shall take the blood, strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the house wherein they eat the Passover. And he went on to say, when I see that blood, I'll pass over you. I won't pass through you like I am going to the land of Egypt tonight. So I want to ask you a question. Moses, Aaron, come here, come, come, come here. Are you, are you saying the only way a firstborn will be saved from this plague is if we take a male lamb of the first year on the tenth day of this month, an unblemished lamb, and we keep it until the 14th day of this same month, and then we kill it in the evening, and we strike its blood on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the house wherein we eat the Passover. Are you saying that's the only way we can be spared from this 10th plague? What would the right answer have been? It's the only God revealed way. Who am I to change it? Why would I want to change it? Did Moses and Aaron say, or would they have said, if they had been asked such, would they have said, hey, you know what? If you want to just pray the firstborn prayer, the prayer for the firstborn, and say, God, you're so powerful, I don't need to smear blood anywhere to get your power dispensed. God, I'm asking you by virtue of this prayer right now, I'm asking you to protect my firstborn from death. Father, I'm a firstborn. I'm asking you to protect me from death by means of this prayer. Amen. I'm asking you tonight, could God, could God have saved men by prayer if he had so wanted to? Yes or no? Would he have been able to save them that way if that was his desire? Yeah. Yeah. But once he says, that's not my desire, who do we think we are to come along and try to substitute a prayer for the means of salvation God has given? And so the clear answer was they needed to do what God says. And you know, I didn't mention this a moment ago, but I'll throw it in. Genesis 6.22 says, Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Go for wood meant no wood, that's not go for wood. Make it 300 cubits long meant uh, you don't make it 301, you don't make it 295. And they could count to 300 and they knew what a cubit was. So 300 cubits, 50 cubits, and they gives all the other different measurements for the ark. Now, was one measurement, length, breadth, height as good as another? No. Do what I said. No, it did according to all that God commanded him. Would you look at Exodus 12, 28? What did they do? The children of Israel went away and did as the Lord had, had commanded Moses and Aaron. So did they. In Noah's case, so did he. In their case, so did they. So will we? Will we do what our New Testament enjoins us to do, which I'm going to show you in a moment. These Old Testament examples were written not for our law, but for our learning. And what we can learn from them is, if God says, here's what I want you to do, then you do it the way He wants you to do it. You don't add to it. You don't take from it. In fact, I ask you, was one house as good as another during the 10th plague? Was a house without blood just as good as one with one? You know the answer. And then one final example from the Old Testament, and then we'll move to New Testament application. Was one house as good as another during the battle of Jericho for Rahab and her family? Now you remember Joshua chapter 2. Rahab had already let down the spies, and now in Joshua chapter 2, she's being given these instructions. We're going to come into the land... And we want to make sure you and your family are going to be protected. So here's what we're going to do. Verse 18 of Joshua 2. Behold, when we come into the land, you bind this line of scarlet cord or thread in the window you let us down by. 
Question, was one color cord just as good as another? Rope is a rope is a rope is a rope? No, it needs to be scarlet. That's what our instructions are going to be to the rest of the people. You're looking for the scarlet cord hanging, and was one window as good as another? From the same window you let us down by. All right. So question, what if Rahab's family, and they told her, look, you need to bring your, ho your household home to you. You need to bring all your, fa your father, your mother, your brethren, all your father's household, they need to come to your house where that scarlet cord is hanging from the window you let us down by. If they want to be saved, your house is the safe place. Rahab, what makes your house better than ours? It's not. Why do we have to come to your house? It's not because I decreed it so. God said that's the place where he's going to save me if the scarlet cord's hanging in the window that I let down the spies by. And so I'm asking you to come to the God-appointed place. Who am I to change God's appointed place? Won't you come to my house? In Joshua 6, we find out whether they did come to her house. She invited them. Did they come? Joshua 6.22 Joshua said to the men, the two men that had spied out the country, go into the harlot's house. That's what her former occupation was. Go into that house and bring out the woman and all that she has, just as you swear unto her, as you promised. And the young men went in. They brought out Rahab. And this is where Hollywood would cut to commercial to see if anyone else came to her house. We don't have to wait for a commercial to be over just read it. Here comes her dad. Here comes her mom. Here comes her kinfolk. They've all come to the safe place. And thus, they recognized one house was not going to be as good as another for them when it came to the battle of Jericho. They needed to be in the God-appointed place. Now, that brings me to the application for you and me. Is there one location for salvation tonight on in the bible do we read of one location and one plan of salvation well let me just let the bible do the talking for me and I, may i suggest to you that if you're ever asked the question about are you saying one has to be a member of of the church of christ in order to be saved may i remind you first of all that question should not have been so terrifying to Noah if he'd been, are you a saint? Somebody has to be on board that ark in order to be saved? The answer to that is quite apparent, isn't it? But this is where our emotions can sometimes get in, in the way. And sometimes people don't really hear the answer because they don't like the answer. And so they don't see the reasoning behind the answer. I want to highly recommend, brethren, friends, that we not just give a yes or no answer to this but that we let people discover from reading God's Word itself what God said about this, because that's powerful. They might think you just don't know what you're talking about, or that I don't know what I'm talking about, but if they read it right from the pages of this book, they're dealing with God, not me, not you. So what does God's Word say about how many places for salvation there are for those who want to be saved today in our day and time? Well, look at the screen at the top, Ephesians 5.23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And then notice the spotlighted words, he is the Savior of something. Of what is Jesus the Savior? He is the Savior of the body. All right. So if this is the body... And I'm out here, not inside the body. If he's the savior of the body, but I'm not in the body, then I'm not in that which he is the savior of. Must I be in the body in order to be in that which he's the savior of? Yes or no? Does this verse on the screen teach that in order to be saved, I must be in that which he is the savior of? Which is what? The body. All right. I've never had anyone miss this in my personal Bible studies. I'll ask them to read Ephesians 5.23, and then I'll say true or false, based on this scripture, 
A man who wants to be saved needs to be in the body because that's what Jesus is the Savior of. They never miss it. You say, well, yeah, logical. All right, here's the next thing then. And two more verses do this for us. Ephesians 4.4, 4, which says there is one body. It's just one. So not only do we need to be in the body that Jesus is the Savior of, we need to recognize he's the Savior of only one body. And we need to make sure that we are in the body that he is the Savior of. And that leads us to the last passage Ephesians chapter 1, 22 and 23, gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. Now, before I analyze this, I want to ask one question again, as I always do in my Bible studies. Using this diagram or drawing it out on a napkin or a scrap piece of paper, I've done it all those different ways. My wife helped me develop it in PowerPoint format so I could use it in meetings and so on. But here's the simplicity of this, dear friends. If the stick man represents someone outside the body of Christ, and the body of Christ is that which he is the Savior of, and there's only one because there's one head, Christ, and he's not connected to multiple bodies. One head connected to one body. That's what we understand to be the norm. One head, one body, does this man need to be in the one body that belongs to Christ, of which Christ is the head, in order to be among the saved? If Jesus is the Savior of the body, and there's only one body, does this man need to be in that body? And I've never had anyone miss it. They always say yes. And you know one reason why they're so quick to answer that they need to be a member of the body of Christ? There aren't in their minds, uh, there's not in their minds a thought of, hey, you know what, there's a denomination called Body of Christ, and they're a real popular denomination. No, they're not thinking denominationally at all. They're just thinking about the body of Christ. Well, may I look at the verse at the top of the screen with you and note something? He is the head over all things to the church, and what is the church based on the inspired pen of the Apostle Paul? It is, it's his body. So let me ask you, can I take the word body and replace it with the word church based on Ephesians 1, and 23? Since the church is his body, then I could put the word body there. Or I could put the word church there because the church is his body and the body is the church. Now, if when this was what it said, I understood that this man needs to be in the one body that belongs to Christ and I understand that the body is the church, then let me ask you, based on the book of Ephesians, the inspired word of God, does this man need to be a member of the one church, the one called out group that belongs to Christ in order to be among the saved? Yes or no? That's the clarity of Scripture. And the only thing that makes it complicated is emotions, quite frankly, because we, we just don't want to accept that. But friends, it's, it's true. And here's where we really need people to hear us. We are not saying the following, and I'll elaborate more on this tomorrow night, but we are not saying of all the denominations that exist on the face of the planet Earth tonight, there is one denomination that's better than all the others, and that's the Church of Christ. Friends, I've never believed that, never taught that, never preached that, never will. There is... A body question in Acts chapter 2, was there a church that belonged to Christ, yes or no? Was it a denomination known as the church of Christ or was it just actually the church of Christ? It was the church that belonged to Christ. And if they could be members of the church of Christ without being members of a denomination, a part of the whole known as the church of Christ, then friends, if you and I do what they did, won't we be what they were? What were they? They were just members of the blood-bought church that belonged to Christ, the Lord's church. 
And friends, if you're here tonight outside, I'm begging you to get into the body of Christ tonight by hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized for the remission of sins as we see them doing in the book of Acts. And if you, friends, may I remind you, God has at times confined salvation to one location and one method of salvation. And so here is the divine method for New Testament people. It is to hear the Word of God. That's how faith is produced, Romans 10, 17. It is to believe Jesus is the Christ. If you don't, you'll die in your sins, John 8, 24. It's that all men everywhere repent, Acts 17, 30. And the goodness of God ought to make you want to repent, Romans 2 and verse 4. And then as a penitent, confessing believer, you ought to be baptized into the body. In fact, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, By one spirit are we all baptized into one body. The way we get this man into the body of Christ is after he's been a penitent, confessing believer, we see him baptized into the body, and the blood of Jesus does all the work. It washes the sins away and adds him to the church, the blood-bought. I'm so grateful tonight that you and I can be members of that blood-bought church of Jesus Christ, and I'm so thankful that most folks here tonight probably have obeyed that gospel. But may I remind you of one thing before I step down? In Joshua's day, they were told, hey, you get folks to your house, Rahab, get them to your house, and tell them if they leave after they get to the safe place, their blood's on their own head. They're not safe anymore. Friends, if you get into the body of Christ and then you go out and start living like the prodigal, you're not safe anymore. You're still a member of the church, you're still a, a son, but you're an erring son and you need to fix that. Your father is waiting to run to meet you and forgive you and give you the blessings he has to offer. Won't you let him? Won't you do what needs to be done in view of eternity? Won't you please? Right now as together we stand and as we sing, 